I asked a rude question last year, so I might as well do it this year. Uh, so what? And, and I, I mean that in the nicest way in the sense that, you know, if, if you, those of us in this room, we have a lot of data literacy. This is what many of us work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we, you know, we've seen some amazing, gorgeous, beautiful, immersive data visualizations, and yet the issues, Gemma, that you talked about exist. We have data visualizations doing this, and, but we also have privacy issues scaling at the same sort of frequency. So a person on the street in Manchester may look at that and say, that's fantastic, but it's not making me change my behavior. And so those vulnerabilities still exist. So how do we reconcile the ability to, to create ever more uh, gorgeous images and data and um, the, the almost kind of draw to perform for that data and therefore compromise our own privacy and surveillance, or do we compromise it? Long question. <laughs> Who wants to take this um, I, I could start. I think we need, we need better tools, even though if only we activated the existing tools, that would be already a step forward. So um, the law can help us, and if it's not helping, it's because there's people that do not want the law to, um, to help and to be implemented. But then I also think we have technological challenges that need to be addressed. Um, our anonymization techniques are not robust enough yet. And until people have easy to use tools that can protect their online identities, people won't switch to, um, to, the, to the tools that we already have. We can ask people to become a hacker to protect their, uh, their, their online identities. Their, the, the learning curve is too steep. And that needs to change. So I think that technologists need to start investing in privacy-enhancing solutions and privacy-enhancing um, technologies. And that is already happening. I think that in the last six months, the progress has been amazing. Uh, people installing VPNs, um, screens being developed, uh, new operating systems. But we need more effort going into that and maybe less effort going into other things. Um, but just identify anonymization and anonymity as one of the, of the new, the, the upcoming frontiers of privacy. I think that's quite crucial. I think a focus on defensive technology is good, but we also need to think about what offensive technology looks like and how do we produce tools for activists and, and activism. Um, I think that communities, we need to understand how data can be used by communities and, and, and in communities, which are questions that I think we've largely failed at. I think. You made the great comment that um, data science is mostly English language. It's also heavily privileged, and mm. the, the we we have we have really been very we've done a very poor job of understanding how these you know I think very well-meaning approaches can be can be used by the actual people who are in the communities that are being affected, and I think we we as a, a community can take. Um, a lot of we, we need to talk to people who are community organizers who are who are activists who are working and have successfully worked and to take take something from from those approaches I think and I include myself in this statement we've really sucked at that for the last you know ten, ten years yeah I mean maybe just briefly a comment I, I do actually think everybody needs to become a hacker uh, maybe not in the strict sense of the term, but I think to understand how data can go wrong and all the, the little decisions that go into making a database decision or a data visualization, I do think you need to have experience at once and actually like try and collect your own data set, try to measure something of importance to you, and then learn how, how wrong you can be, how much you can jump to conclusions, how, how little it actually represents the thing you care about. I think you need to experience that once. And I think this is actually the point where we need to start, is like that everybody becomes more fluent with working with data, being a, an author in this realm, uh, being an actor in this realm. But how do we do that? I mean, this is, this is kind of the massive challenge. It, it shouldn't just be a binary choice between more anonymity tools or um, you know, better filters for your images. There needs to be something in between because we're not seeing more engagement beyond, you know, a, 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 I would say a sort of small population. The, the mass public isn't kind of taking up that challenge to actually kind of interact with their data other than to perform in a way, you know, to actually to, mm. to take selfies and in fact kind of capture their own data. Yeah, but th things are changing. Um, there's a lot of 
privacy by disaster happening, what you just mentioned, that because people experience the problems um, caused by their careless use of uh, their own data, that they react to that. Um, but we also see younger people, people under 20s, understanding a lot more than, a lot better than older people what the challenges of the information society are. The problem is that their only choice is to withdraw from those tools. And that is a problem mm. because you're telling them if you want to protect your future you, you need to not use all these things that are so popular and that guarantee you a social life. So it's a hard um, choice to make, but we do find that younger people are making that, that choice. So I, I guess there's a, we've been in love with technology for a long time, and now we're beginning a stable relationship. And lots of people are realizing that we're, we're gonna continue to be together, but now I can see that there's things about you that I like less. So I'm not <laughs> in love with you, and I don't think that everything about you is fantastic. I'm like, okay, I, get, I take you for what you are, and there's things that I like more and things that I like less, and there's things that I change about how I behave in order to adapt to the, to the pitfalls that I've identified on you. And so I think that socially, as a society, we're, we're climbing, like we're going from in love to in a relationship, and, that's, and we, we're getting data of that. It's not just an opinion. Um, we, we're finding bits of data that, that, that corroborate that, yeah. that hypothesis. I mean, I think you're right. The, the big challenge is really that the last five years or so, the awareness of all these issues has risen, absolutely. And I think it's like, you know, every. There are all these discussions on Facebook about the terms of services, and people post pictures to <laughs> step out of that. So there is awareness, but at the same time, we had this brutal consolidation that you don't have a choice today anymore. Which search engine to use, which social network to use, um, or where to post your images. There's no practical choice. And I think that's, that's quite that's unfortunate. Jer, one of the things I was thinking about, you know, when you were talking about your ooh-ah kind of construct of, of of engaging people with data is, has data become too beautiful? Um, you know, we have, we have a lot of Monet's and, and, and uh, you know, sort of impressionistic data being shown, but we don't have enough sort of Sheila's or Lucian Freud's or sort of, is there value in, in sort of presenting people with the, not necessarily ugly data, but the reality of their data? Well, I mean, I think 99.9% .9 of anything we do visually with data is in the let's use clear communication. Like, there's like, there's, there's not a plague of beauty in data. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think that if anything, the other way around. And, and, and uh, I mean, we, I think we all, we all know the rules, quote unquote, about how we should use data to communicate. And, and, I think we, we fall we fall into a trap there though is in, in that the the um, the graphical language that we use to 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 describe data and to show data tends to be charts and graphs and most of us were raised in school where charts and graphs are in boring textbooks and we actually we actually not only don't care about them we actively we actively dislike them and 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 so like if you want someone to ignore something especially like a like show a show a graph you know because we are in some ways fundamentally raised to a the, the associate those things with maybe subjects we're not particularly interested in but also they're like there are like they're they're baked with a trust so that I, it's in a graph graph and like the graph itself is just like a a truth object, and I don't actually read the graph or anything, but just because it's in a graph, I'm like, check, that's the way we go. And so we need to disrupt, we, we do need more people disrupting that, and beauty's not the only way to go. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that, maybe the work that I was doing five years ago was really centered around beauty, but I don't think that's the focus of the things that I'm doing with data anymore. I, I, I think we can make things beautiful if we'd like to, but I don't know. My, my whole approach is let's just try different things. And, and some of them might stick and some of them might, might not, but we need, to get the mess we need to get some of the inherent messages about these topics out into culture and the, there are vectors to do that, whether it be film or theater or performance or that are different from the one that we're, we're, we think we have to use, which is the, you know, the graph or the chart. There's a, there's a great quote in Banksy's book um, he was painting the, the wall in Palestine and a local went, pa went by what he was doing and said, you make the wall beautiful, go away. And, that's, and that, I think that's something you need to think about. And, and I think you need to make a distinction between visualizations that use legitimate data and visualizations that use personal data that people have, are not aware is being used. So mm -hmm. you need to make that distinction. But I think that the idea that you know, someone might come and say, you're making this awful thing look nice, 
stop doing this. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I mean, I think about sort of, you know, people react more strongly when they see, um, you know, if they see themselves in a kind of wall of selfies, for example, you know, they may wave to sort of, you know, get a reaction, but if they see themselves in a no-fly list, that's a slightly different experience. But they're, you know, in a way, they're both kinds of personal data. Mm -hmm. Um, one question actually from uh, Alice Thompson, somewhere I think in the hall, it's kind of a, a broad but challenging one. Which do you believe holds more importance, digital identity or face-to-face -face identity? I think it's got to be a combination of both. The only thing is that face-to-face -face identity, you have some sense of control. With digital identity, you have no control whatsoever. And that's what we need to develop. Probably getting digital identities closer to what a what a face-to-face -face identity is, because we can control what hap what happens. Even though when you create a registry, you lose some. Uh, but honestly, identity is a construct either way. It's you know, it's. Um, but who, but, but who construct the, the, the face itself? But in face-to-face, -face, you, know. you have the illusion of you building that. Even though it's the person looking at you that's also building yeah. their idea of you. But when it's digital, you have no control. So you do not know what's being made up out of your uh, interactions, thoughts, or whatever. But in some ways, the digital identity, you know, the digital identity has similarities to our physical one in that you know, there is no like digital identity. And even within, within advertising, different advertisers are seeing different pieces of you. Right. The whole system is this gigantic Kludge together a mess that nobody understands, and 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 so these these decisions are not in fact being made based on some type of precise idea of us, but instead at some hazy thing that if you turn it in one direction you see one thing, and if you turn it in the other you see another. And I think that actually it actually does provide a pretty good analog to how the way that our personal identities work. My identity on stage is different from when I get off the stage. It's different from when I left my hotel room this morning. It's different when I talk to my girlfriend. It's different when I talk to we actually present a, like a, a myriad of, of, of identities, and, and in some ways, like what I what I have found about about our research with Floodwatch, and, and is this like this stuff is really bad. It's like really <laughs> messy and inaccurate, and the, the the big elephant in the room in advertising is that this stuff really doesn't work very well. And you could actually get much better results just by paying somebody to ask them a set of questions. <laughs> but there's this like romance of the spyness of it. People like, oh, we're making algorithms to figure out, and it's like a bunch of dudes. They love this, right? They're like, we're gonna. We're gonna, like, they wanted to be James Bond or something like that, and now, and now they're like doing these things even though it's, the result of it's stupid, and it doesn't work, and, and, and it, like, the, whole thing, the whole thing is like, fundamentally broken, and, and part, of it, part of that ability is to show people. Like, I think that's one of the great things about Floodwatch, is everyone, it was what you were showing. Like, our identities aren't, they don't match, and, and, and a lot of that's just to do with the fact that this technology sucks, and the people that are making it aren't very good at their jobs. Well, I think the key phrase there is it's just a bunch of dudes. So that's, that's one kind of hidden problem in all this, but that's another panel uh, that doesn't have a bunch of dudes on it. Um, can I take one quick question from the audience? Is anybody, is there a microphone kind of wandering around? The bell tolling here. The bell is tolling. <laughs> I think if we could just, there's one hand there. This is like a hammer film with the bell. Yeah. Um, yes. yes, one quick Hello. question. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, with the issue of personal data, I wonder if you could comment on implied consent so that, you know, if I use Gmail, then the implication is that I consent to them using all my details, or if I buy an iPhone, then the implication is that I consent to them doing whatever they want with my personal data. I have a friend who wrote a thesis on consent. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's complicated. Um, we have passive and active uh, consent in theory. But then in practice, all consent tends to be passive because the terms and conditions are impossible to understand by anyone and then they keep changing. Um, there's a great story in an analogy in what happened with medical consent. Medical consent, the fact that you have to sign a sheet before you go into the operation room, was a victory of, uh, of patients' organizations because finally there was some clarity in the, in the medical words that, are being, that we were, be, what were being told before, before putting our lives at risk. Um, and that victory was turned against us. And now when you sign the consent form, basically you're giving away your rights. So unless you win the bigger battle, having active consent will not mean anything because they, they will turn it in its head and in the end it will work against you, which is what's happening now. Even when we have active consent, informed consent, they turn it against its head and basically you're saying yes to everything. And if you say no, then sorry, you cannot access this service. We, we broke we broke the system with computers a long time ago. Like, 
the fundamental way that we interact with software is through a software license. Like, you don't actually own the software on your computer. You're, you license it from the producer of the software. So, like, the operating system that you get from Apple is actually Apple's property. And so, they could, they could, and they could and do, not Apple specifically, but other OS manufacturers, install, install, like, make changes to your, so to the software on your machine without telling you because, it's actually legally their property. So we, we went down this really weird path from the beginning with computers and software where, where we, 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 we always gave, gave the fundamental power in, the, in that relationship to, to somebody else. And, and I think we're reaping what we sowed there in a really big way. And, and, and in, in, I, I, there's the cons consensus to say that where people are consenting to the Facebook software license is, is patently, re patently ridiculous. I mean, it's too, as somebody was say, calculating how long it takes to read the Facebook patent <laughs> li the license, and it's like in the it's like days. You know, you have to. Oh, I'm going to sit down for like I think it's 19 hours or something like that and read the license, but no one's going to do that. And yet, but yet we accept it as consent. It's fun, it's broken, but it's also built on 40 years of brokenness. But also, if, if you consent, privacy is not an individual thing. It's a collective thing. If you consent to an app stealing all your data from your phone, and you have me in your phone, then you're, you're putting my data, in, you're making my data vulnerable. Mm. And that's why we need laws that protect this, this as a collective thing, because you might make decisions that are not the best decisions for yourself or for others who are unaware of the, con the consequences of your decisions. We have a client now who pays customers to um, respond to surveys online, and so they get paid by large companies that want to survey large um, groups of people. These companies are now telling our client, we want to we want to pay these people to install super cookies in their computers. That means that the companies will be able to see everything that they do online, turn on their microphones, cameras, etc. Can a person be allowed to make that decision? When we know that we could have other people in front of, the, of that camera, or when we know that that decision made in, in that moment might have broader implications in the life of that person, should we not protect people from themselves um, as well? In the same way that we do when we make it compulsory for cars to have seat belts, we're protecting people from themselves. Shouldn't we translate the same thing into data management? And that's probably the way to go. But we need to create the social consensus mm -hmm. that will allow us to, uh, to enter this new phase of information in a, in a better way, in a, in a safer way for our data in our future. I think we're going to have to leave it there. I mean, there, there are so many fantastic threads that have been opened up here. Obviously, opportunities to talk about this for the rest of the day, the rest of the weekend. Jer, Gemma, Moritz, thank you so much. Thank you for your questions. And we'll take a quick break and then back to talk about the stories that come from data. Thank you. Thank you.